This is my speedrun of Pac-Man World 3 Any% percent on the PC version of the game. The run starts out by skipping the tutorial section that's at the very start. So you'd normally need to fight a bunch of these monsters and it would take around a minute, but what we're going to do instead is go to this gap that's in the back left corner of the area and then just go out of bounds. From here we can go maneuver our way over to a different out of bounds section and that'll let us skip the switch that you'd normally need to hit in order to access this elevator. While we're riding these elevators, I can explain the movement mechanics of this game. The fastest form of movement is the rev roll, and you can charge it for up to a second in order to get maximum distance. You can also jump out of a rev roll in order to get more distance. Otherwise, you're going to want to be jumping, and then after that just walking is the slowest way to move. In this next room, you'd normally need to hit a series of switches to lower a bridge, but instead we can grab a ledge and just skip the entire room. There's a lot of these invisible ledges throughout the game, and they can be abused in order to exploit lots of parts of levels. After this elevator, we'll get to our first spectral fight. These fights are pretty boring, but the run just happens to skip almost all of them. And we can skip this one by setting a checkpoint and then immediately voting out, as you'll see right here. So we go past the checkpoint here and Void Out, which just skips the Spectral fight. And now we go past the Galaxian cutscene, which skips that. Now we have a Reveral Plate. These will show up throughout the game. They're pretty painful, but... Have to do them. So that Reveral Plate activates the end of the level. You can jump a little before that cutscene activates, which saves a little bit of time. And that is the end of the first level, Bot Boneyard. The next level in the run is Banny Wastelands. This is the first time where we see the Ribbon Loop power-up. This power-up will give you a speed boost while you're walking, and it also lets you create a circle around enemies to kill them, but we're not actually going to be using that here. We will see that later on, though. This is yet another Rev Roll Plate. We're going to see a bunch of these throughout the run. This one you actually can skip, but it's pretty tricky, so I don't actually do it in real time. Here there is a quick shortcut to get this key earlier. You'd normally need to go around on the left side, but we can just do a series of somewhat precise jumps to get up here. With a few rev rolls, we make our way to the second spectral fight of the game. This one, just like the first one, is also skippable, but we're going to be doing a slightly different technique here. Since this is the PC version, we actually have the ability to bounce on top of spectral portals. On the console version, you can still skip the spectral fight, but it requires doing a damage boost. This method is significantly easier than the console one. So we take this pack dot chain, which is pretty slow. Can't skip this one though, and then we do an infinite rev roll. So if you rev roll jump onto a slope, it'll actually keep going forever and that tech is going to show up later. There we did a jump over a cutscene trigger. Now we're going to make our way to this climbable surface over here. And we're going to attempt to do a super jump. If you climb the very side of a climbable surface, Pac-Man will enter this weird glitched climbing animation. Where if you press the punch button, it'll just give you a ton of vertical speed. What we're trying to do here is to use that to land on top of the door. If we actually land on top of the door, we can walk forward, and then by doing that in a precise way, we can actually load the next area. Since the game doesn't like to load the next area until you enter it through a certain point, we need to do that in a very specific spot, and that's what I did there, and that skips the entire puzzle room. After destroying those explosives, that completes the main part of the level. And the next part of the level is Talkman, where I will talk about the history of Pac-Man World 3 speedruns, since it's an auto-scroller and there's not much else to talk about. I first got into Pac-Man World 3 in July of 2015. For a while, I'd been surprised that there were no runs of the game. A bunch of people had done runs of Pac-Man World 2, but World 3 was basically untouched. 
I started messing around with the first few levels, and I did find a couple of skips, but I kinda got frustrated and stopped looking into it for a while. Another runner named Lori decided to continue where I left off. She ratted the rest of the game and did a run that was around 3.5 hours long. Soon after, another runner named 2561 first pushed the time down to just over 3 hours. At this point, there were a few skips in the run, but most levels were still done the intended way. This all changed in March of 2016 though, when first discovered the super jump glitch. Or at least we thought he was the one who discovered it. A Neoseeker.com entry for Pac-Man World 3 on PS2 from someone named Noob World describes the exact same glitch back in 2009. Yet for some reason we never knew about it. With super jumps, there were way more skips in the run. The record time got pushed even further, and eventually another runner named Prince Rallis used the new strategies to get a time of 2.39. In July of 2016, I randomly decided to look at the Pac-Man World 3 leaderboards and watch it run. And I was really surprised by all the new discoveries since I hadn't seen anything that was found in the game since I'd stopped playing it. Later that month, I decided to make a tool-assisted speedrun for the game, using Prince Rallis' tutorials as a guide. I ended up with a time of 1.30.25, and I found a few new skips in the process. My hope after making the task was that all the old runners would come back to the game, but it didn't really happen. So in December of 2016, I decided to start running the game myself. I beat the record on my first run, and I got sub 2 hours after about a month. At this point, two glitch hunters named Sky and Venic decided to start looking at the game, and a bunch of new skips started getting found. This resulted in me pushing the record down to a 128.06 by May of 2017. At this point, I knew I needed to redo the test, which resulted in a new tool assisted speedrun with a time of 57.59. There were several new strats found while making the test, and I incorporated those into real-time runs in March and April of 2018, eventually getting a 123 flat, and that's the run you're watching right now. The first skip in this level, the Spectral Cliffs, is the Time Keys skip. We jump on this ring, wait for it to move to the left, and then Reveral jump off of it. That avoids having to get the Time Keys, which would have moved the ring to a more easily accessible spot. We make our way over to the first spectral fight of the level, which we can't skip. This fight requires us to eat 8 spectral monsters. In general, there can only be 4 monsters out at a time, so we'll wait for 4 to spawn, eat a power pellet, eat those monsters, and then repeat the process for the other 4. The movement of the spectral monsters is pretty random however, and it requires a lot of improvisation on my part trying to reveral jump on top of them, which is why I couldn't actually complete it in two cycles this time around. The power pellets also spawn on a timer. What I try to do is switch off between the two power pellets that are available. Completing this fight makes the platforms move back into place and it lets me get to the second spectral fight of the level. If there was some way to get to this doorway early, it would skip the first fight, but there isn't actually a way to do that. The second fight in this level can be skipped with some out of bounds maneuvering. Normally completing the fight would open up a bedoink pad which would let us bounce on it in order to get to the third spectral fight. What we'll do instead is take advantage of our ability to bounce on spectral portals get out of bounds, and then bounce on invisible collision to get to the upper level. Here I bounce a few times and then charge a reveral and then get the angle that I want. After we load in the area, we'll take advantage of a glitch in order to skip a phase of the third spectral fight. If you set a checkpoint during a fight that involves spectral monsters or katrons and then reload the area, it'll advance the phase of the fight by one. Since we activated that spectral portal, and then going in this hole sets a checkpoint, one phase of the fight will be skipped. This next fight is pretty straightforward. The most notable thing is that I only eat two spectral monsters for each power pellet. It's possible to eat four, but it's pretty much TAS only, so I don't even go for it.
The power pellets take a while to respawn, so I actually alternate between two of them, even though that one seems pretty far away. This portal is the one where we skip the phase, that's why we only have to eat two spectral monsters from this one. So that ends the fight, and now we're going to make our way over to the door that we just unlocked. The next room involves a series of time keys that unlock a door. There's no known way to skip this door at the moment, but even if there was, the time keys would still probably be faster, just because you're pretty much taking a direct route to that door anyway. One annoying thing about time keys is that if you reveral jump into them, you'll probably bounce off of them unless you do it from inside the time key. So on that one time key, it's pretty tricky to avoid getting hit, which is why I kind of do this weird movement where I do a rev roll off to the side. That takes us to the fourth spectral fight of the level, and this one we can also skip. Once again, we'll bounce on the spectral portal, and then we'll jump to a conveniently placed ring, and then get on top of it. From here, we can just jump to the platform that leads to the next area, and this skip saves around a minute. That takes us directly to the 5th spectral fight of the level. This one we cannot skip. And if you're getting a sense of these spectral levels, you'll see that they're pretty much just spectral fights one after another. And honestly, if those skips didn't exist, it would be incredibly boring. But luckily, we only have to do a few of these fights. And the ones that we actually do end up doing, they're not too bad because there is some skill involved in trying to adjust to the luck that the game gives us. This fight once again has 8 ghosts. Ghosts are spectral monsters, the name doesn't really matter. The reason that that distinction even exists is because the ghosts from the original Pac-Man game are actually on your side, while these spectral monsters are some sort of knockoffs who you're trying to fight. It's a bit weird. It's just the thing though, and it's a part of the story. So this room has some disappearing platforms. You can make your way across it pretty fast without really having to go across everywhere because you know those little pack dots are there tell you exactly where the platforms are. Maybe if they weren't it would be a bit trickier. And this is the last room of the level. We just have to make our way over to this end trigger. And that's the end of the Spectral Cliffs. The fourth level of this game is Gogeka Central. At the very start, we get our first encounter with Pinky, who is one of the ghosts that is on our side in this game. We're not going to need her though, because we can just do a rev roll jump onto a specific part of the collision that will give us a jump back, and then use that extra jump to get onto the ledge. Immediately after, there is a gate that leads to a cutscene trigger. Entering this cutscene would have caused the fight to appear, but if we do a rev roll jump at the right time, we can jump over the trigger, and that skips the fight and lets us enter the elevator to the next area. This elevator leads to the first spectral fight of the level. Gogeka Central's spectral fights are somewhat unique, because rev rolling into the spectral monsters can never result in you bouncing off of them without eating them. This isn't true for the spectral fights in other levels, but it does apply to the two fights that we'll see in this level neither of which you can actually skip. This fight has six spectral monsters, so I just eat four with one power pellet and then two with another. As you can see, rev rolling into the monsters really helps. It's a lot simpler than trying to time a rev roll jump and landing on them. After we go through this door, we see two switches, and these switches open up the door to the next area. They normally require three hits, but it's actually possible to do them in two hits by bouncing on the same frame that you land on the switch. This technique is pretty much test only though, so I don't go for it. 
The start of this next fight sets a checkpoint, which means that we can take advantage of the same phase skipping glitch that we used in the last level. By voiding out immediately, we can skip having to kill three of these Katrons. We can then use the Electroshock Power Pellet to kill the last three Katrons. On the last Katron, you'll notice me just doing a bit of damage and then walking in the other direction. This is because the Electroshock continues to do damage as long as you hold down the button and don't target any other enemies, even if you're no longer locked onto that enemy. In this next room, our goal is to get to the very top. Taking the Bedoing Pad lets us get onto the Metal Rod, which we can then use to get to the higher platform slightly earlier than intended. Over here, we can walk along a ledge, do a wall jump, get onto the higher ledge, and then do a precise jump to grab the pole. This skips having to lower a metal beam and traverse a bunch of bedoings, and it's just a lot faster and a lot cooler. Now that we're at the top, we've reached the second spectral fight of the level. This fight has 8 ghosts, but we can reveral directly into them just like in the first fight, and the power pellets respawn fairly quickly, so it's not too bad. Here I wait for more ghosts to spawn before getting the power pellet. I would normally wait for 4 in a fight like this. But since the power pellets respawn so quickly, it's faster to just grab three pellets. So that switch right there, it's actually possible to get to it without beating the fight, but it doesn't actually do anything until the fight is beaten, so it's not possible to skip it. In this room, we can use the super stomp power pellet to kill these enemies a lot faster. It's possible to do all these reveral plates without killing the enemies, but it requires incredibly good luck, so it's only really possible in a task with some RNG manipulation. If the enemies hit you while you're reveraling, it kind of stuns you, and then those things just start going up, so I really want to make sure that there's no enemies near me before I start doing it. One cool property of the Ribbon Loop Power Pellet is that it prevents enemies from actually touching me. If they're caught in the ribbon, they'll just kind of sit there and do nothing, so that's why I use that there. Activating these reveral plates lowers a pipe, which will allow me to get to the end of the level from the room where the Katron fight was. So now we're just going to backtrack all the way to that room. If there was a way to get across the gap that the pipe covers, we would be able to skip the entire section that we just did, so we just go straight to the end of the level after the Katron fight instead of doing all of this. There is no way to do that though. You may have noticed that after the fight with the Katrons, there were actually two doors that got unlocked. The other door has an elevator that leads to a lower area, and there are switches there that end up raising a platform. However, by doing this wall jump right here, we can completely skip going to that area. To complete the level, we need to do a maze, which we can access once we activate this reveral plate. This is one of the three mazes in the Any% percent run, and all of these mazes end their respective levels. These mazes are pretty similar to the mazes in Pac-Man Arrangement, mostly because of the boost mechanics and the 2.5 dimensional style. Our goal here is to just collect all the Pack Dots and Power Pellets, hopefully without losing all 3 lives, because then we'd have to redo the maze. There's also a bug that spawns after a while. Ideally, you want to finish the level before that starts spawning more Pack Dots, because otherwise it just wastes a lot of time. The next level is called the Spectral Veil, and it's another spectral level. We're gonna climb up and make our way over to a puzzle room. This puzzle would normally involve having to bounce on a bunch of these purple platforms in a certain sequence, 
but doing a reveral jump onto the tallest one skips most of the puzzle. So that purple platform allows us to get to this purple platform, which makes a reveral plate spawn. And if we activate this reveral plate, it'll allow us to get to the next room, which is another spectral fight. This fight is pretty tricky because it takes place on multiple floors, and since there is so much distance between the two portals, it's sometimes hard to eat four of the spectral monsters in just one power pellet. Luckily there are quite a few power pellets, so I can just kind of recharge while eating them. And I use a small infinite reveral here to make the movement a bit easier. Overall, this fight went really well in this run. Normally, the monsters wouldn't be in such convenient spots. The next room introduces purple switches, and these switches, when you hit them, spawn a series of purple platforms. So in this room, we just navigate the purple platforms and then hit each switch one by one. The collision of the platforms is a bit janky, which is why I don't actually use reverals everywhere, and I do a few jumps. There's some times when you land on them, and you try to do a jump, it'll give you a bounce instead and you'll fall all the way down. Here we hit another switch. This spawns more platforms, because we need to get on top over there. There's no other way to do it, but with these platforms. We now approach another spectral fight. This one conveniently has some blue disappearing platforms really close to the spectral portal, and since we're on the PC version we can bounce on portals, we can skip the fight quite easily. In this next room, we have our first encounter with Clyde. Normally you'd need to get a red crystal in order to use this pack dot chain, in order to get up to the reveral plate that's up there, but if we do a precise ledge grab, we can actually skip it. Pay close attention to this geometry, it actually reappears in a later level, the same model, and we'll be able to do this exact same skip in that level as well. So now we activate Clyde and then immediately cancel him. Activating Clyde does two things. It creates the spectral portals, which allow us to cross the gap and get to the next part of the level, and it will prevent a soft lock at the end of the level, when we'll need to use Clyde again. So if we hadn't activated Clyde and somehow managed to cross that gap, activating Clyde later would just make Pac-Man get stuck in a bubble forever and we wouldn't actually be able to beat the level. This room has disappearing platforms in a very similar fashion to the Spectral Cliffs, but there are some purple switches mixed in as well. Luckily with some reveral jumps we can actually skip hitting the first purple button and we go directly to the second purple button at the start instead. Now we have to take a somewhat roundabout route since we have fewer purple platforms at our disposal. This is still a few seconds faster overall. Now we approach a room that would normally have a spectral fight and then a series of time keys, which would take a couple minutes. However, we can skip this entire room by getting on that ring over there, and then navigating on the seam that's on the outside of the room. Getting on the ring is pretty tricky because it doesn't actually have a fully circular shape. We need to wait for the ring to be in a certain cycle before grabbing it. Also, staying on these seams is pretty tricky. I use butt bounces here because it allows me to stay in a consistent spot on the seam, but actually trying to get a reveral while on the seam requires some somewhat precise timing, which is why I fell down there. So on the second try, I actually do manage to do the skip successfully, and that takes me to the final room of the level. So now we approach a series of three Clyde fights. 
Since we can bounce on spectral portals, it's pretty easy to skip all of the fights. The first skip is really straightforward. You just jump on the portal and then you get over to the second fight. I did mess it up there. Normally I would just do the rev roll jump straight from the portal instead of falling down. For the second skip, I actually need to make sure that I do it quickly enough because I need to enter the trigger for the third fight while the text is still on the screen. Since the game can't start a new cutscene while another cutscene is already happening, this completely prevents the third fight from spawning, and that just lets me use Clyde in order to finish the level. Normally I would have to do the fight instead because the power-up would be blocked by the spectral portal. As Clyde, I wait a little before destroying the pillar because of the same cutscene cancelling phenomenon. So if I activated the end of level cutscene while the text was still on the screen, the game would have soft locked and I wouldn't have been able to beat the level. This is Zephyr Heights. We start out in a small arena where we have to defeat a series of enemies, which will allow us to get past the gate that leads to the next part of the level. If we could somehow get over the gate, we'd be able to skip the fight. We use the ribbon loop power pellets on these enemies because it's a lot faster than trying to rev roll or bounce on each of them. The ribbon loop only lasts for 15 seconds though, so I can't kill the last three enemies with it. Here you can see the ribbon loop running out, so I actually have to rev roll on these guys. This green monster appearing knocks down the door so now I can advance and I'm done with the fight. Now we can head over to the first windmill of the level. This section can be done quite quickly with some rev rolls. And right here is the windmill. We need to activate this windmill so that we can activate the moving platform which will allow us to get to the ledge that's at the top of this room. Activating the windmill requires a propeller so our first task is to get that. If there was some way to get enough height in this room to get to the upper ledge we'd be able to skip getting the propeller. That climbable surface right there can actually be used to get a super jump and it is possible to get up past the wooden platform right there but it's just not enough height. Now I void out immediately because this puts the platform in a better cycle which will save a few seconds. It's a bit scary, it can actually softlock the game if I don't void out quickly enough, but I go for it anyway because it's like 5 seconds. If I didn't go for it, it would be just throwing away a free time save. After this tunnel, I do a rev roll jump over a cutscene trigger to skip a short cutscene. And here's a second windmill. Luckily we can skip this one with some checkpoint abuse. By doing a rev roll jump at a precise angle we can hit a checkpoint that leads to a lower area and we'll spawn there after voiding out. Now we see a third windmill but we can actually skip this one as well. By getting on the wooden plank and then doing a rev roll jump that hits high enough on the wall we can set another checkpoint that spawns us on top. It's actually possible to get up there without needing to set the checkpoint in void, but it's tricky to do it consistently. So if I don't get it, I just void out and it loses a few seconds. We'd normally need a key here to unlock this door, but by going out of bounds and setting a checkpoint, I just spawn in the next area. This room's fairly simple, you just hit all four switches, and then you rev roll on the rev roll plate to bring down the platform. We don't need to bring it down all the way though, just enough so that I can escape this room and get to the lower level. After climbing up here, I do a rev roll jump to skip a cutscene. And now we'll get to the first skippable maze of the run. So unlike the maze in Gogeka Central, this one doesn't end the level, instead it spawns a pack dot chain that leads to the next part of the level. However, we can just rev roll jump to get there and it bypasses having to do the maze completely. 
We'll now head over to the Catacombs, which sort of foreshadows the next level of the game, which is Ancient Catacombs. In the next room, we have our first encounter with Scorpions. These are probably the most annoying enemies in the game. They move really erratically, and they tend to be near reveral plates, which means that they stun you constantly unless you get really lucky. There are three of these reveral plates in this section. For the first one, I just punched a scorpion, which gives me enough time to open the door. For the next reveral plate, I climb up and I grab a ribbon loop power pellet. And this makes the scorpions not attack me since they're caught inside of it. It's pretty similar to the strategy that I used in Gogeka Central. For the last reveral plate, I kinda just need to get lucky. I've actually lost several runs by dying in this section, each time it was caused by the scorpions just being too relentless. As you can see here, I did get attacked a few times, but I had just enough invincibility time to finish doing the reveral plate. Now we approach the first of two bosses in the run. This one is called Gigatron. The bosses are extremely similar to each other, and I'd actually say that the first one is harder than the second. My goal is to activate the three crystals that are in this arena, each of which requires, once again, a reveral plate. Doing this will bring down the boss's shield, which will give me enough time to do damage. My goal is to do this boss in 3 cycles. You normally get 18 seconds on the first cycle and 14 seconds on the second and third cycles. The timer will also get cut short when you destroy the second ship part or the fourth ship part. You'll see what those are once I start destroying them. So this is the third crystal and now I'll be able to attack the boss. Each of the ship parts has 20 health, a reveral does 6 damage while a butt bounce does 2 damage, except for the last hit of the combo which does 4. So because of this, I end up doing 2 reverals and then a full butt bounce combo on each of the parts. This ends up doing 6, 6, and then 8 damage for a total of 20. After the first cycle, the boss spawns a bunch of Katrons. They're normally not really a problem since they move slow enough for me to just avoid them but occasionally they get a really good snipe and I end up getting stunned while trying to do a reveral plate. So now I'm just doing the three crystals again. Each of the cycles is the same for this part. On the second cycle, I will destroy the remaining ship parts. This will allow me to start doing damage to the cockpit. You might be wondering why I didn't just damage the cockpit from the start, and the answer to that is that it has its own shield that stays active if there are still ship parts left. It's actually possible to use a reveral to do damage through the shield, but it takes a long time and makes you take damage, which makes it not really feasible at all. got hit by the laser there, which was pretty unlucky, and now the boss is spawning more Katrons. That wasted a bit of time. On the last cycle, I just destroy the cockpit, this defeats the boss, and it ends the level. At the start of this level, we see that there is a small puzzle that we have to do. We need to activate both reveral plates, but there is no key for the reveral plate on the right yet. This means that we have to do a scorpion fight in order to get the missing key. However, there is a way to skip this entire area by going out of bounds and maneuvering on a series of seams, but it's definitely test only because of how precise that movement is. We first need to kill these two scorpions with reverals. Each of them takes 4 hits and my goal is to hit both of them with each reveral. For the second part of this fight, I use a ribbon loop power pellet followed by an electroshock. 
The scorpions can sometimes glitch out, land on top of each other, and move around in really weird ways, but it's generally fairly consistent otherwise. As you can see, that scorpion landed on top of the other one. Luckily, it didn't start sliding around chaotically. After getting the key, I do a small super jump to skip having to climb up this wall. Then I can just activate the reveral plate. And then finally lower this column thing to open the door. In this room, I need yet another key, but since it's located high up in the room, a place that's only accessible to pack that chain, I need to get a red crystal and activate it. After getting the key, we can unlock the door to the next area. Now we get to a room that would normally take a really long time to complete casually. I'd need to collect a bunch of detonators and then use them to lower a platform. We can skip doing all of this though with a reveral jump and then a series of punch jumps. Punch jumping is a tech that allows you to jump while on a slope. If you punch while you're standing on a slope and then jump during the punch animation, you can get a jump when you otherwise wouldn't be able to. Doing that repeatedly allows you to jump to unintended areas. This wall jump here lets me get to the reveral plate right away, which I can use to lower the door at the far end of the room. Once again though, scorpions near reveral plates are a nuisance. Reveral jumps make this room a bit faster, but these jumps are pretty tricky. I fell down here because I just barely missed the butt bounce onto an invisible piece of collision. So now this room has a fairly long puzzle that requires Pinky. We haven't actually used her yet in this run, but Pinky's role is to spawn platforms, and we'd normally need to do that here in order to get to the top of the room. However, by taking advantage of a wooden plank that just happens to be in the right spot, I can get onto the stone pillar and then get to the end of the room. It's now time for yet another spectral fight. Luckily, we still have the ability to bounce on spectral portals, and this spectral fight skip is just as simple as most of the earlier ones. All I have to do is bounce on this portal and then climb up to this top ledge. The end of this level is a maze, and since it ends the level, it is required, just like the maze in Gogaka Central. I wait to take some laser damage here, it might not have been necessary, but if those lasers hit me while I'm doing the reveral plate, it would stun me and then force me to do it all over again. This maze is probably the most difficult maze out of the three in the run, mostly because it's really easy to get eaten by a ghost at an inconvenient time. It's also a bit tricky to actually move in the proper direction, I try to buffer my inputs, but sometimes they don't work if I accidentally hold down an extra input for too long. I also go out of my way to eat the bug, because otherwise it's really hard to finish the level without it spawning any pack dots. This level is Gogeka Heights. The level is themed similarly to Gogeka Central, hence the name, but with a lot more danger throughout the level. There's fire, acid, and eventually a bomb that we'll have to defuse. The start of this level makes us do a fight with the purpose of getting two valves that we'll have to use to put out this fire. The fire is basically a wall that leads to the next area, and there is a potential skip here if we could somehow get past the fire without doing the fight. There's no way to do that at the moment though. That was also yet another example of the super stomp power pellet being useful in a fight. Now that the wall of fire is down, we can advance to the next part of the level.
We take damage here so that we have invincibility and then do a few wall jumps to avoid a cutscene trigger which skips a 20 second long cutscene. We can then do another wall jump to skip having to do this fight entirely. Now with the electroshock power pellet we jump across these pistons and then activate the generator. The pistons can be really annoying, kind of like the purple platforms we encountered in the spectral veil so I play it safe in this room. Now we get to the big climbing section of the level. The entire room starts filling up with acid, and our only goal for this room is to just get to the very top. You might be wondering why I didn't just do a super jump at the very start of this room, because surely that would be a lot faster than climbing up each individual platform. However, the reason is that super jumps only work on climbable surfaces that have ground below them. And since a lot of these surfaces are on walls that are floating in the air, I can't actually do a super jump on them. I can do a super jump here though since there is ground, and that at least lets me skip part of the climbing section. However, it locks the camera in a really weird spot where it's basically fixed until this cutscene plays. And now, more pistons. Since the pistons aren't rising when I'm trying to jump on them, it's a lot less risky for me to do rough roll jumps here. After hitting these switches, I'll enter a fire room. The fire room would normally require getting a series of valves and then eventually hitting a button in order to put out the fire. I can skip the first floor with an infinite rev roll though, and then I'll be able to clip into the next room by grabbing an invisible ledge. Here I'll first do a safety save because if I fall or die in the next few rooms, I'd otherwise respawn before the start of the fire room. Now I can get onto the lasers. From here I can grab the top of the door frame and then use that to get into the next room. That skips a fairly long pinky puzzle. I can do the same thing again to get past another door, and now we're in a room that has a bunch of pillars. I'd normally need to use Clyde here to knock them down, however with a rev roll jump and then a series of butt bounces I can get on top of this pillar and then rev roll jump over to the far ledge. These butt bounces only work on the PC version just like butt bouncing on spectral portals. A super jump here lets me skip having to ride a platform around this room. Now I can ride a pack dot chain to this level spectral fight. This fight can't be skipped, but it does have a couple of small optimizations. I can do wall jumps to skip having to hit three of these switches, that's why I only had to hit that one switch right there. The fight is also really luck based because there's just so much room for the spectral monsters to maneuver, and it's often difficult to do it in two cycles without some good luck. I did manage to do it in two cycles in this run though, so each cycle was just eating four of the monsters. That completes the fight, takes us to the final room, which is the bomb section. The game gives you six minutes to defuse a bomb, which will also end the level. We can skip the fight at the very start with a well-timed rev roll jump. Now we can wait for a good platform cycle and then skip the second fight as well. However, I did mess up this part pretty badly in this run, and it was probably one of my biggest mistakes.
I had to get health there because without any health I wouldn't be able to do the damage boost here. So now, right here, we actually have a climbable surface, which means that we can do a super jump. This super jump will let us get right to the bomb. This skip was actually found before I ever played through this level, so I've never actually done this part the intended way. I hear that it's pretty annoying though. After activating all three Breveral Plates, I hit the button to defuse the bomb, and that ends the level. Banny Canyon is an interesting level because of all the potential sequence breaks that just don't work out. A lot of later parts of the level are above the earlier sections, and the very end of the level is actually accessible from the very start. However, because that ending area doesn't load in properly when you go there from the start, the level end trigger doesn't get loaded in either. After we skip having to go down this elevator, we can skip a spectral fight as well by getting on some invisible collision and then doing a reveral jump. After the fight, we'd normally have to destroy these blocks with Clyde, but we can jump on the blocks instead to clip out of bounds and skip having to do that as well. A mini super jump here just makes the movement a bit faster. And now we enter the hub room. A later part of the level is actually above the area that we're in now, but there's no way for us to access it without voiding out. We can jump on this cactus and then take advantage of some weird collision to get to this reveral plate faster. And now we need to use Clyde in order to lower this pillar that leads to the mine. It is possible to get to the mine without it, but there's no way to get back out without the pillar being there. So now, rather than going directly into the mine, we take the long way around so that we can enter the door from the top. This allows us to bypass the trigger for the Katron fight, which would normally take around 30 seconds. It also prevents the flame jets in the mine from ever activating, and that makes the movement in the mine far less annoying. The first thing we need to do in the mine is to complete this fight. That'll get rid of the lasers that just appeared, which block us from exiting the mine. The Electroshock Power Pellet is really good on mechanical enemies, so I just use it here to kill all of them. The reason that we went into this mine in the first place is to get a key. However, the key is behind the laser gates, which means that we need a way to get over the laser gates in both directions. This minecart would normally be used with Clyde to just disable the laser gates completely, We'll instead use it to gain some extra height, so we can do a damage boost over the lasers after getting the key. So we moved the cart to a very specific spot, which also moves the cart on the other set of rails to the correct position. Now we can go back and get the key, so first we do an easy damage boost to get over the lasers once. After getting the key, we'll jump on the cart that we moved, do a damage boost, and get back over the lasers. We now have everything that we need from the mine. I void out here for a pretty strange reason. Doing so actually makes an enemy in a later fight in this level spawn about 5 seconds earlier, which actually saves time overall. This door here is why we needed the key, and it leads to the level's first spectral fight. We can't skip this fight, but it only has 3 spectral monsters, so it doesn't take us very long at all. When we finish the fight, it activates the Reveral Plate, and that allows us to rotate the room towards the area we want to go to. It's actually some pretty clever level design.
The next area is what will eventually be the end of the level. If we could somehow make it all the way down to the sandy area that's on the left, it would let us finish the level early, but instead we need to get a propeller and take the platform down. This fight is the one that gets sped up by the void out that we did earlier. It allows us to just use the super stomp pellet and finish the fight really quickly. We can also continue to use the super stomp on this large green enemy. That gives us a key which allows us to progress further in the level. Now we get to a room with scorpions. Luckily they're not as annoying this time because we get a super stump power pellet here as well. And we can just spam that to kill all the scorpions pretty quickly. That gives us the propeller that we'll need to finish the level. As we're backtracking, a spectral fight appears, but we can just bounce over these portals and basically ignore it. Putting in this propeller makes the platform go up, where we can now reach it. We'll ride this platform all the way down, which will lead to the next level, Takman Battle. It's not really much of a level though, as the entire battle is just on a timer, and it's impossible to save or lose any time unless you game over. I won't be doing any commentary for it, so if you don't want to watch it, skip ahead to 54 minutes and 50 seconds into the video.
Cragstone Bridge is one of the longest levels in the game if you're playing casually, but in a speedrun it's one of the shortest. After we climb up these ledges, we run into a new character, the Ancient Hero. There will be some interesting cutscenes involving him in the next couple of levels. We can do some wall jumps here to get to the upper platform a bit faster, and a rev roll jump onto this rocky surface skips us having to get a red crystal and ride a pack dot chain. We can do a cutscene skip here by rev roll jumping with a proper angle. And here's the bridge that the level is named after. The intended way to do this part is to find a key that will lower the gate that leads to the bridge. However, we can skip all of that. First, I get this crystal to set a checkpoint that's closer to the bridge, just in case I fail. Then, I get into the right spot and rev roll jump as late as possible, which just barely lets me make it onto the bridge. I can skip a pretty long fight sequence here by just bouncing on these blocks. And here I can skip this maze by going on the outside part of the enclosure, which is pretty similar to what I did in Zephyr Heights. I need to be careful not to fall here since these ledges are pretty finicky and if you jump too early you might actually just butt bounce and fall all the way down. I use this rev roll plate to lower the door. I don't need to lower the door all the way down, just enough for me to be able to get through. Now we get to the puzzle section of the level. There's two keys in this room with scorpions, but because there are climbable walls, we can just super jump to the top key, and then jump down to the lower key. Because we never killed the first two scorpions in this room, the scorpions near the last rev roll plate won't spawn at all, making this part a bit easier. With another climbable wall, we can super jump to the last key. We can use the key on this door, which is the end of this room. In a casual playthrough, you'd need to hit several buttons and navigate all over that room just to get that key, but the super jumps skip all of that. This outdoor section is the last part of the level. The end of the level is at the very top, and we'll take advantage of some super jumps to get there. We can do a small super jump here to skip climbing this wall. Here there's a slight shortcut to skip going through this tunnel, just uses a rev roll jump. Now that we have some more climbable walls, we can start doing more super jumps. So we do a small super jump here to get to this higher up wall, and then do another super jump all the way to the end of the level. You'd normally need to use a rev roll plate to access this tunnel, but the super jump gives us enough height to just drop down into it. The first room of Irwin's fortress is pretty annoying. We need to use this rev roll plate to open up the door, and we also need to get a key from a Katron. However, with all these enemies around, it's possible to lose quite a bit of time here. Putting in that key activates the elevator.
After we ride up the elevator, we can quickly kill all these enemies with a super stomp. We can do a super jump here to get to the next door way faster. I try to hug the wall when landing the super jump so that I avoid the trigger for spawning the enemies, which makes the next room far less chaotic. Inside this room, there is a reveral plate that leads to a key. It's possible to get into that room without activating the reveral plate, but it's tricky to get the room's collision to be loaded when entering from a different direction, so I don't do it in runs. After getting the key, I can do another super jump to get back up. By hugging the wall here, I can skip a short cutscene that would have played. In this next room, there would normally be a 20 second cutscene that plays, but I can just jump around the trigger and then grab the electroshock power pellet to use on the generators. There would normally be a fight in this room that requires lowering both of the stone doors in order to get to it. That, in turn, would require using both reveral plates. However, if we just use the left reveral plate, we can take advantage of how the doors are positioned to get to the very top of the room. We can do a wall jump here to get onto the first door, and then do a jump to get to the second door. Now that we're on top, there's a series of invisible ledges that we can grab. It's a bit tricky to grab them because you need to be facing the correct angle. Once we're on the ceiling, we can maneuver on the seam and then jump down into the next room, which skips the fight. The room isn't loaded unless we do a reveral from a specific spot though. In this room, we need to destroy two explosives in order to open up a laser gate. I'm not sure that this actually makes any logical sense, but it's pretty consistent with this level's lazy design, so we just accept it. After we reveral through these tunnels, we can ride a pack dot chain to this level's first spectral fight. We won't need to fight any spectral monsters, but we will need Clyde here to destroy a box. With the box gone, we'll then use Pinky for the first and only time in this run in order to create some platforms, which will open up the door as behind the spectral portals. You're not supposed to be able to create these platforms until you've opened up the floor, but you can do it anyway. Now we can take advantage of a hole that's next to the spectral portal in order to just skip it. On this platform, a wall jump and a butt bounce skips having to raise another platform. Now we're just going to navigate to the top of the room. I tried to lower this platform just enough for me to be able to jump on it, but not too low that I can't get to the top without it moving up. However, I did fail to jump here, which was a pretty costly mistake. Now I'll just make my way back to the platform.
We can drop down into this next arena which would normally have a really long fight sequence. However, we can roll jump onto the door and then grab a ledge to clip through it. I charge a rev roll while riding up this elevator so that I can release it once I'm at the very top. This lets me catch an earlier cycle of the rotating platforms. I can also take advantage of the lasers to do a damage boost. My goal in this room is to destroy all the explosives on this floor, and I'd normally need to do this on the second floor as well, but since we'd end up unlocking a climbable wall once we destroy these explosives, we can just do a super jump to skip the entire second floor. Once I'm on the ceiling, I can maneuver around the seam and get past the laser gates. I stand in place a bit to get the room to load back in and then ride the elevator up. We have another spectral fight here, but we can skip this one by just bouncing on the portal. Once we hit the switch, we can ride this other elevator up, which ends the level. Dungan Gundan is one of the more broken levels in the game. There has also been a new skip found since I did this run that saves around 1 minute and I'll be including that in the video alongside this run. At the start of this level, I somehow managed to void out two times. It kind of shows how weird this game's collision can be sometimes, although it was still a couple of really dumb mistakes either way. This room would normally take a really long time to traverse, but we can take advantage of a super jump to skip right to the end. This super jump is fairly difficult though, because we can't go directly towards the exit door. Instead, we need to go slightly off to the side to avoid unloading the collision. I have a pretty consistent setup for it though, so it's really not too bad. This next room is where the new skip happens. In the bottom left corner, you'll see that with an infinite rev roll and a lot of seam maneuvering, you can actually skip this fight section. However, in this run, I have to do this entire fight. I take advantage of the Katron face skip glitch, which I previously used in Gogeka Central. Every time I use the safe portal, it sets a checkpoint, so I can just skip a phase of the fight by voiding out. It barely saves any time overall, but it's a lot more consistent than fighting the enemies, so that's why I do it. Plus it's kinda cool to get to use the glitch in this other place. The Super Stomp Power Pellet makes this fight a bit faster, but overall there's still a lot of waiting for enemies. I don't need to kill both of the last two Katrons, only the one that drops the key. This also prevents a short cutscene from playing. After I defeat the last Katron and get the key, a spectral fight spawns. Luckily, we can just butt bounce over the portal. So these hallways have several reveral plays that open doors. But as usual, I don't need to open them all the way, just enough for me to be able to squeeze through.
In this outdoor area, you'd normally need to take that pack dot chain and then use Clyde and Pinky to eventually get to a button, which opens a door. What we'll do instead is a slightly different type of super jump called a pseudo super jump. On some ledges, if there's collision below you, you can constantly move towards the collision and then charge a super jump without needing a climbable surface. The charging time is far longer than for a normal super jump, and you usually don't get as much height either, but it's still really useful here. Once we release the pseudo super jump, we can navigate the seam and make it all the way to the top level where the button is. Hitting the button opens the gate to the next area. The reveral plate in this room is a bit scary. Reveral plates in general are really finicky and it's possible to be standing directly on the plate and have the reveral not actually register. If that were to happen there, the enemies would have started getting in my way a bunch and it would have potentially lost a lot of time. Now we need to destroy a series of explosives in order to open up laser gates. We'll take this super stomp power pellet and use it on these big green enemies. It's pretty hard to hit both enemies at once with a super stomp, so I usually just end up having to kill one of the enemies with butt bounces. Killing these enemies starts this cutscene, which will spawn a Katron that has a key. I'll retrieve the key and move on to the last room of the level. This room contains the final required maze of the game. I'll kill some enemies to make it easier for me to use the reveral plate. And after I kill the enemies, I'll take some damage so that I have invincibility and then I can open up the maze. This maze is definitely the easiest out of the three we have to do since there isn't much boosting and the movement is pretty straightforward. The bug that shows up later isn't really much of a problem either. At the very end we do take advantage of this one boost though and eat the bug and that'll finish the maze and Duncan Gundan. The Spectral Zenith is the last of the Spectral levels. Just like the other levels, it has plenty of skips to make the gameplay far more interesting than what you'd expect from the level design. At the start, we're able to skip the entirety of the first room, which would normally require doing a fairly long puzzle involving lenses and a spectral fight. Instead, we'll go straight to the end. By squeezing our way into this corner and then bouncing off the wall, we can get boosted onto the ledge. The big lasers would usually send you backwards and away from the ledge, but they have holes in their collision that allow some exploits. We can do infinite reverals in this room to make the movement a bit faster, and then we can skip the entirety of this room as well by going past another laser. This vertical room would normally have three spectral fights. We'll skip the first one by doing a damage boost onto the reveral plate, and then going up to the second fight. We void out here to get rid of the first spectral fight, which makes the spectral monsters in the second fight spawn sooner. We actually have to do this fight, but it only has 6 spectral monsters, so it's not too long.
I need to be careful not to void out or die in this fight. If I do, it'll put me at the bottom floor where the first fight was, but I won't be able to get back up, so I'd have to just restart the level. While we use the Reveral Plate to get to the top level, you might notice that the outside platform starts to desync a little bit from the inside platform. If we allow the inside platform to connect to the top but not the outside platform, the third spectral fight will just not spawn. Now this is the disappearing platforms room. It's just like the ones in Spectral Veil vale and the Spectral Cliffs, but here we can actually skip hitting almost all of the purple buttons with some reveral jumps. We only need to hit this last button so we can spawn some platforms that'll let us get to the exit. You might recognize this next room. It has the exact same geometry as the very end of the Spectral Cliffs. The next section also reuses geometry from the Spectral Veil. Vale. In Veil, vale, we were able to skip using a red crystal by doing a precise ledge grab. We can do the exact same skip here to avoid needing any of the three crystals in this room. This skip in both levels is actually pretty annoying though. It seems random how long it'll take before it starts to work, and when you do get the ledge grab for the first time, it's a lot easier to grab it again on your next several tries. It's almost as if the level has some kind of oscillation going on. We can skip a purple button here, and now we have the last spectral fight of the game. It's the only spectral fight that we actually have to do as Clyde. There's a save point immediately before the fight, and if we could get to the save point and back, we'd be able to do the phase skips glitch here. It's not possible at the moment though. This fight is pretty difficult to do quickly because it can be hard to avoid taking damage. Clyde only has 3 health, and if I die as Clyde, I'd need to activate the Reveral Plate again, which wastes around 10 seconds overall. The main difference between the three types of spectral monsters is the way that they attack you. The red ones just chase you around, the green ones kinda do a boost towards you, and the purple ones have a laser that they shoot after a while. Even though the red ones are the simplest spectral monsters, I'd say that they're actually the most likely to damage you when you're as Clyde. The next room is a pretty slow puzzle sequence, a calm before the storm that is the last level of this game. After using these reveral plates, we need to get a lens and put it in the center of the room.
That opens up two Reverol Blades. After we use both of them, it'll end the level. There's a big skip at the very start of the last level. When playing casually, you'd have to fight three waves of enemies and ride a platform to the bottom of the level. We can instead use an infinite rev roll to get out of bounds. From here, we can do a precise jump, a few butt bounces, and then fall all the way to the bottom. The collision at the bottom isn't visible, but it's there. We can go through the doorway to the next area, which sets a checkpoint, and then void out. We can skip the next room as well. Rather than destroying a series of explosives, we can do a wall jump to get on top of these laser gates. We can then do a damage boost to go completely over them. That'll take us to the final boss. The final boss is called Terratron. It's really similar to the boss we fought earlier. This time though, we need to activate 4 crystals instead of 3 for every cycle. The boss also has 2 small lasers instead of 1 big laser. Taking damage isn't too big of a deal here because there's so much health around the arena. The premise of this boss is that we need to rescue the other two ghosts, Inky and Blinky, and then finally defeat Erwin. We'll be able to defeat this boss in two cycles by taking advantage of how the cycle timer works. We get 15 seconds to do damage to the boss on the first cycle, but whenever we rescue a ghost, the timer goes back up to 4.5 seconds, if it is currently less than that. Each of the ghosts takes 24 damage or 4 rev rolls to rescue. If we do a rev roll on the first ghost and then rescue the second ghost, the timer will reset to 4.5 seconds. That's just enough time to do the other 3 rev rolls on the first ghost, which resets the timer to 4.5 seconds again. That lets us do some damage to the cockpit. On the last cycle, I'll finally be able to finish off Erwin by combining rev rolls and butt bounces. Overall, this run was pretty good, especially the second half. However, there were some pretty glaring mistakes, and the new skip in Dungan Gundan means that there is a lot of potential time save. My long term goal for this category is sub 1 hour and 20 minutes. Right now, it's just barely possible, but I think with some improved movement and maybe a couple of new skips, it could realistically be achieved.